Hello, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome. Um, I'm excited to give some context for this conversation with John Verveke and Christopher Mysotrepo. I, I don't know if I said his name right, um, but it's said with love and deep respect. So before before I do that, I want to have some uh, have some house, housekeeping. So if you're interested in exploring circling, which is what I do at the Circling Institute, um, and some of what you see here, uh, there is uh, we have weekend courses. We have a year long training coming up. The last one's sold out, but we are open for registration for the next one. There's a Thursday Thursday evening open event to everybody. That's six to nine, and. Uh, Please come. It's an amazing, it's an amazing experience. It just keeps deepening for me. I feel very humbled by it um, in the best way. If you're interested in, in working with me one-on-one, -on -one, I am taking clients. Please email me and um, we can, uh, I'll, 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 I'll get back to you and we can talk about what that is and what that costs and all that stuff too. Okay, so <laughs> I don't know quite what to call this conversation with John and Chris. This was actually our first three-way video with just the three of us. Um, I really felt at home <laughs> in it. So the intention of of this was to was to come in and um, and start to lay the groundwork for looking at the relationship between dialogue dialectic and dialogos with sanyata, or the notion of emptiness. And to look and explore to see if, if in what way is the, you could say the Buddhist notion of, of absolute emptiness, right? Not nihilism, not, not nothing, right? Not, not the opposite of something, but this deeper sense of absolute emptiness. Um, Emptiness is form is in form is emptiness. In what way is that present in dialogos in ways that maybe we don't totally understand but are have been true the whole time? And so it's the beginning of it. we wanted to start laying the groundworks to explore that. But boy, talking about this in the sense of no thingness in the openness that affords all of the back and forth, right, of listening and speaking and insight, background and foreground, this mutual penetration of the background and the foreground up and down, bringing all of that, that together was just really, 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 I mean, it was present in the conversation. Um, I really was quite moved by this, by, by this, by this, Dialogue. On one level, we were talking about things that were really kind of abstract, but it felt so personal to me. So, really enjoyed this one. I'm happy to share it. Please share it with your friends and family. And uh, if you want the, if you want to get notifi notifications for all future emails, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Thank you. Begin. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for having us here, guys. Thank you very much. To be with you guys again. I think this is the first time, I think just the three of us have done Could it, be. I think. Could be, yeah. At least, at least the first time we've done it and recorded it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. Oh, that's, that's right. We've yeah. had a little side things and stuff, yeah, yeah but not yeah. recording it. That's right. Yeah. So, so, so there's some stuff that, well, actually, there's nothing that brings us together. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, the the punning is gonna just we're, it's gonna get out of control. I, I, I can already actually, tell. I think I've noticed how I have to just keep a lid. I normally have to keep a lid on it, but when it comes to nothing jokes, it's like it's all right there, and it has me think about there's something about nothing and humor. It's very linked. So um, nothing is better than long life and happiness. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich is better than nothing. So a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is better than long life and happiness. <laughs> I've, I've always heard that uh, that that uh, 
prism told with a ham sandwich instead of a peanut butter sandwich. I think yeah, that changes it yeah. dramatically. So that's why I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I changed it. Slime it, right? Yeah, so I mean, the point about the equivocation and why it's famous, and you know, this goes back to the Middle Ages, is mm -hmm. um, thinking about no thing and nothingness is uh, quintessentially very, very hard. Um, we are liable to fall into conceptual confusion about it very readily. Um, I was actually in my daily practice, I wanted to share with you guys because it was just so apropos for this conversation. Uh, so I, I read, after I do the Lectio Divina, I usually read from some Neoplatonic sources. I was reading from this book, the Introduction to Neoplatonic Philosophy. Mm -hmm. And um, I was reading from Porphyry. It's, um, Porphyry. it's often translated this, this, uh, this, uh, tract, uh, this treatise, I think, yeah. Is often it just given the rather prosaic name, uh, the sententia or the sentences, but the, <laughs> the Greek is actually launching points to the intelligible, which I think is a much better title. And so <laughs> I'm reading through this and then I, there was a passage at the end and I, I thought it, this might be a good place for us to start because I think it, it, it brings, because uh, what I'm interested in and, you know, and Chris and I are working on this and, you know, uh, I know, um, uh, guy you've been reading, uh, Nishitani, is I'm, I'm very interested in the relationship between uh, Dialogos and some of the central concerns of the Kyoto School. But just this thing from Porphyry was just so amazing. He, he, so he talks about uh, a, a kind of bogus, that's the translation, I don't know whether it was in the Greek, <laughs> a kind of bogus experience. And so he talks about to be elevated towards the non-being that is beyond being may also be set astray towards that non-being that constitutes the collapse of being. So the, 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 the one, one of the most- one more, one more time, one more time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you're, what, the bogus can experience, experience can occur as you, right? And you're in the process of being elevated towards the non-being that is beyond being, that's the one, right? Mm -hmm. May also be set astray, right? Towards that non-being that constitutes the collapse of being. So one of the most Great. significant ways in which we can yeah. bullshit ourselves and yeah. get into a bogus experience is to mistake, well, right? To mistake the movement towards the non-being that is beyond being with the non-being that results from the collapse of being. That which is, if we want to continue the metaphor, that which is below being. And so he takes it that one of the most important forms of discernment that we need is the discernment that articulates the disclosing difference between those two. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we Close need to do? The disclosing okay. difference so that we do not confuse yeah. and bullshit ourselves by mistaking the, 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 the sense of nothingness as the collapse of being, the merely privative notion, yeah. with the nothingness that is beyond being, the superlative sense of nothingness. And, and that strikes me as central. I thought that insight in Porphyry captures perfectly the central insight in, you know, in Nishitani's religion and nothingness. Because the whole point, right, exact, the whole point is that nihilism can only see the no thing that is the collapse of being, and it can't see, and it confuses that with the no thing that is beyond being, the one, this, what Dionysus often calls the super essential that is beyond being. Yeah. So I thought that was an interesting connection because that, 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 that brings up the question, what are those practices that would bring, would afford and empower that kind of discernment of the disclosure of the difference between the privative sense of non-being and the superlative sense of non-being so that we do not fall prey to the biggest bullshit. And that's what Porphyry is saying, he calls it bogus. And we, we, we can get out or get beyond or dissolve nihilism as Nishitani um, uh, proposes. So I thought that was, a, you know, just this amazing yeah. convergence between, you know, um, you know, the student of Plotinus, Porphyry, and one of the pivotal figures within the Kyoto School. And I, so for me, that's exactly, sorry, I'll, I'll shut up in a sec. That's exactly 
the thing I want to explore in this work that Chris and I are doing on whether or not di dialectic into dialogos is one, I'm not saying it's the exclusive, but is it the kind of practice that is particularly well designed to affording that discernment of the disclosing difference between the privative and the superlative sense of what is beyond being or other than being as Levinas might put it. Um, and I, and that's the question I really want to focus in on right now. So that was a bit of a speech, but I thought it was, um, you know, if I was a union and there are, there are days of the week when sometimes I am, I would, I would uh, regard that as a synchronicity that, you know, cause you know, you have to understand when I'm reading that passage, I've done all my yeah. Tai Chi and, you know, my meditative practices, my contemplative practices, I've gone through my Lexio Divina. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this super receptive state. And then I hit that thing yeah. from Porphyry and it was like, boom. Oh, yeah. yeah, I really get that. <laughs> yeah, I, um, well, a, you know, a few, a few things that are there is I've just been enjoying thinking about, right? What is it? Like, you know, parsing out a, a conversation, right, or a dialogue, right, that is um, housed in narrative, right, and one in which is its place, I don't know if it makes sense to be housed, but its place or its ground is emptiness. Yeah. Just well, thinking about yeah. that, right? Yeah. yeah. And running that through, right? There, there's something about what I would say is, is that the the classic conversations that yep. that you know as as uh, Heidegger would talk about idle talk, right? Yeah. This idling is really kind of seems to be predicated on the non, if anything, an avoidance of nihilism or an avoidance of feeling the the null mm -hmm. and keeping something going, right? Keeping a narrative going, right? Um, making sure that we're all in our roles, that we don't even know we're in, right? Um, gossip, all those kinds of things that lots of conversation is kind of filled with a certain kind of normativity. It also has a function, right? Oh, social. Um, a social function. But then kind of feeling the difference, what, what happens in, in dialectic, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know how much more attention is there, and how much more mindfulness is there, and especially when it goes to, when it transcends and goes into dialogos. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it is. It's on a different ground, right? Yeah, very much. Yeah. And I, this goes towards an you know an argument in the in the in the philia sense of argument that I've been having with uh, Jonathan Pajot and Paul Vanderclay, and some of the uh, discussions I've had with Jordan Hall. Where I've been basically trying to argue uh, that dialogos is deeper than narrative. It's more primordial. That narrative, uh, der narrative is born out of dialogos. Children have to learn narrative, and they learn narrative out of a an already pre-existing capacity for dialogos. Um, and it's dialogos that allows them to internalize other perspectives and afford self-transcendence. Um, narrative is barren if dialogue is taken out of it. Uh, because dialogue actually bridges between story and, and action in drama. And then you get a sense of, of course, in both the Neoplatonic, especially in the Neoplatonic tradition, but in other similar traditions, of a post-narrative form of a dialogue and dialectic that takes us above the way in which narrative is um, centered uh, upon an, an exchange between egocentric perspectives, but that it is possible to move to something that is a non-egocentric perspective. These are, of course, the mystical experiences, and therefore, um, narrative is not the appropriate way of talking about them. And that leads me to the, 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 the this weird kind of narrative, and I mentioned this to you, Guy, right? Parable in the work of Sally McFagg and others about how parables look like narratives, but they're narratives that destroy narrative. And the point about them is that they don't stabilize and they sort of, they're supposed to jet in use beyond narrative uh, into the kingdom of God to use uh, one of Jesus' uh, famous phrase or to use the Buddhist sense, the other side of the river, right? In which you throw the, the, the raft of narrative away. So is this, I think is all of that- Is like a koan? 
Is yeah, co- uh, yeah. Parables have a koanic function to them. Now, the interesting, interesting thing about koans is they don't run off of narrative. They, they, and this is really interesting if you think about it. You can have a parable that takes you out of narrative into this other place, and you can also have a dialogue, what looks like a dialogue that explodes as a dialogue because the master asks you a question. It looks like you're you're supposed to be entering into a conversation, but it actually explodes the the the, the dialogue from within, and you're blowing into right into uh, into that the, the, this other space i mean so the, the what's it in a, when the koan is like swallowing the red hot uh, ball of iron it's supposed to burn all the way through you until the bottom drops out uh kind of thing so i think there what i'm saying is i think there's deep connections uh between what i proposed and what you have brought up and i'd like to explore those i think there's something about moving communication, communion, cognition outside of narrative into dialogos that will help us face the no thingness, but also, right, also aspect shift it, right? Because if we can fundamentally change how we are present to it, we will fundamentally change how it is present to us. He who stares long enough into the abyss, the abyss will stare long enough back into him. That's Nietzsche. But Eckhart also said, the same eye by which I see God is the eye by which God sees me. Mm. So I'm, if can Dialogos transform us so that we can, as you said, face the Logos. But to face it is to change how we present ourselves to it. So it changes how it presents itself to us. And this has got to, we've got to think about it even talking about it that way puts it into a narrative frame and that's wrong. That's wrong. There's something, there's something else going on there, but I really want to know how is it that I can move into that space without feeling like everything is collapsing away. I acknowledge that this experience happens. It happens for me regularly and reliably. I go post narrative. I go post, right. Even dialogue. I have mystical experience. Right, but how is that? I, I want to put it in really. How is that ecstasis or at one minute different from despair? Different from despair, because the point the point of the idle conversation is to keep us away from despair. But the very machinery that keeps us away from despair, but by its confusion of the two kinds of no thingness also prevents us from genuine self-transcendence. I mean, and this is Kierkegaard's family, profound insight. Until you face, right, the negative, mm-hmm. the negative infinite, as he would put it, you are, you're incapable of the positive infinite. So I, now that I've mentioned Kierkegaard, I should turn things over to Chris. <laughs> well, no, I, so it's interesting. One of the things, that's a really good question, right? How how do we obviate the despair that eventuates when we displace ourselves from the center of narrative? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. And I think part of that, part of that has to do with the fellowship of Dialogos, because to me, the circular fellowship of Dialogos is a stabilizer for the process, right? I think of it analogously to being put into a harness and then lowered into some peril, right? You're put in a harness for a reason and you have people ready to coil you back to safety if need be, right? It's like an exposure training. And I think that the fellowship of Dialogos has, is almost like, um, it's almost like a necessary constraint for the process of exacting narrative into something that's not fundamentally narrative. And so, so starting, so, in a way, because, because, because it's fundamentally a dialectical process, the integrity of the narrative that is to be repurposed, I think is very important. It's important to start with, an, with a narrative that has some integrity and some integrality. Um, just, I mean, just, just like the process of individuation does not require the annihilation of the ego. Mm-hmm. So too, I think, does this confrontation with no thingness. I don't think it requires the annihilation of narrative necessarily. 
but a change in the way we stand in relation to narrative. Mm. And um, so then the question I think becomes, what are then the constraints and the enablers that allow us to refigure our relationship with narrative that has to fundamentally start on steady ground? And I think that the fellowship of Dialogos has something to do with that, with, with that, um, with equilibrating the process so that it doesn't cast itself out of coherence altogether and that it remains in tension with the place where we, we start when we enter into the practice. So, so two things are coming up for me when you say that. One is um, Guy talks about this pivot point, right? Between, and we've talked about it multiple times before and it's one of these aspect shifts. Uh, and maybe it's related to the aspect shift between the negative version of no thingness and the, and the positive version. Because Guy talks about the shift between exposure and vulnerability, right? Where vulnerability is, an, uh, um, it, it is uh, you know, it, it's, it's a sensitivity, it's a receptivity, it's a lack, it, it's an opening, it's a, right? But it's different from, I, if I understand Guy correctly, it's, it's different from exposure, which is that same thing, but very negatively experienced. And it sounds to me like you're saying, if people create the communitas, it's almost like you're, you're like, you know, we've talked about how the sacred is this pole of home and horror and it balances them uh, together. So you get the numinous, right? Exactly. The bivalence. The bivalence. Same thing. Right, right. And so we keep hitting these bivalences. There's the bivalence between the, the exposure, which is, right, ah, right? And the vulnerability, which is ah, right? And then there's the bivalence between, uh, yeah, between right, the, 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 the tension within the numinous and you have to keep the two sides to get the numinous. I, I, so my suspicion is that, that and, and that's, you know, my, my God, that's all the way through Nishitani's religion and nothingness. You know, the stereoscopic grokking of the bivalence, right? And, and, and the bidirectionality, um, like it, going as deep in as deep out right that's ugh, right that stereoscopic move is, is central to him so i get what, I, what i'm sensing is a possible possibility that there's something about the way the practice of dialectic is also itself inherently bivalent that it's stereoscopic that right that it and like you say it's it's properly structured stereoscopic um, I don't know what to call it, stereoscopic practice. Do you see what I'm trying to feel towards? There's something in the way dialectic is managing, right? Uh, it's managing the non-logical at one minute between things that is central to managing this aspect shift, this bivalence, this double aspect nature that right converts exposure into vulnerability and makes and turns us towards the fear of the negative towards the appreciation of the positive version of no thingness. That's when I, does that make sense as a suggestion? I think it does. Well, just, yeah. So, so what is it that allows for this, right? What is it? What is that this bivalence, right? I'm also imagining there's the foreground background shift, which is yep. the yep. huge part of it, right? Where, yes. Like the yep. very thing that we were talking about, we realize, whoa, we're doing yep. the very thing that we're inside of. And there's that yep. moment of yep. something opens up. This thing that starts to thin out to itself and becomes more present, right? Like, like in your meditations that you've been doing, John, like your instructions, you know, the yep. way that you put that thing where it's like you, you, you're like, okay, now go like out breath, go totally the yeah. pointless point, And then in <laughs> breath, the whole universe like and then go back and then go back and forth i was like just the instruction was like boom yeah yeah that that, that interpenetration and commingling right it, i'm wondering if if sinyata um makes itself known in 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 the in what allows for the dynamic of all that mutual penetration that's what I'm proposing, in fact, Guy. I think you put it better than I did. I think there's, some, that's what I was trying to get across, like the stereoscopic experience that happens in Prajna or in, in Spinoza's Scientia Intuitiva. There's, there's something like, 
there's something about how dialect. So I'm, I'm thinking of narrative as inherently sequential, although it has feedback, you know, foreshadowing and, you know, what are they called? Backflash or whatever, flashbacks, right? But what happens in dialectic is, although you're still speaking in sequence with other people, right? You're going in and out. I mean, that's the, that's the main argument that Chris and I are making, like that there's the, there, there's the communitas between people and you're also, there's not just the in and out is becoming all at once. There's the up and down between, right? This context, right? And, 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 and the deepest or highest levels of reality. And, and what happens is, the the oscillation the reciprocal operate oscillation the reciprocal opening in both directions it, it integrates but this is the thing the integration is not the integration we are familiar with it's not the integration of logical integration it's it's that's why we use all these visual metaphors or musical metaphors it's like chris's metaphor of all the instruments tuning up together and suddenly they gel Right? And all they're, although they're playing different pieces, they're somehow playing all one piece of music, right? Or playing different instrument. Or, right, the vision. I have my left visual field and my right visual field, and they fuse together so that I get third dimensional depth perception. It's mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And it's not the kind of thing that is available to, we can point to it in language, but it is not the kind of processing that is actually directly exemplified in language itself. So dialectic is para yeah. paradoxically using language to push push us into a state that transcends language. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And, and I think what, the, what 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 seems possible, right, is it's because it gets really tricky. At least as a Yankee, <laughs> as a Westerner, <laughs> right, start talking about nothing, man. It's so easy to turn it into something, right? But I was thinking about, well, okay, well, what is, what would it be for, um, you could say, an awareness of the non-presence presence of this, right, that penetrates through all of this, allows all of it, negates all of it, and negates itself from all of it, and it presents itself as all of it, and allow it to be present in the way that it is. I started thinking about, well, I think that's where you, you'd, what would that look like? It'd look like Japan, right? that would look like Japanese art, right? There, there is this way in which I've been watching these move, these like little movies of Japan from like when they first had movies, they re-digitized, they're on um, they're just, you know, going down a street of Japan. And it's a real, like you really do get the sense of, well, what happens if you have a culture that it's grounded in nothing versus grounded in, 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 in the sense of being? And you really do get this sense of where they, they they hold open the awareness of emptiness, right? Without ever making it an object, right? In some sense, right? In, in, in the way that they're walking around, they exemplify it. They exemplify what can't be exemplified, right? And I think there's that sense that and as, I'm, as I'm talking about it, it does feel like Dialogos kind of hits that space Right. Mm -hmm. well, right. Well, it hits that. It hits that space where, very similar to what you know, um, Chris and I, as we're reading the the conversation with Heidegger and the Japanese philosopher, you know, it's like six pages of of them talking about the thought they're not speaking. Right. <laughs> this this way of this way of not saying it. Right. But it. But it it pregnates it impregnates itself, right? There there is. I mean, I, I I'm thinking of like, and this is uh, was was this in, what did I read this was this in Nishida? So there you know in the Tate Chen it says you know we 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 shape the cup but it's the emptiness inside the cup that's actually useful or it's the space at the hub of the wheel. Right, and and the, and this was a crit critic. I think it's Maso Abi. He said the problem is we got locked into Aristotle, and this is why I think Porphyry was so important. Yeah. We got locked into thinking of, uh, uh, and this is actually paradoxical for Aristotle in one sense. We, but we got locked. We got locked into thinking of, like, uh, spa the 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 non thingness, the emptiness, uh, or possibility, um, as not not real. 
I, it's funny, I was just lecturing on this today and, and um, our, our, our own science just tells us that that's wrong. I mean, we depend on uh, real, real, con real constraints uh, as you, you like, like, you know, think equals MC squared. Where's that? Where is that? Yeah. It's, right. It's not here. It's not an event. It's not an object. It's not a process. It's a shaping of possibility. Possibility has a definite real shape that's presencing to us because relativity is everywhere and nowhere, but it's not presencing itself to us as an actuality, as something acting, as an event. But it is the ground from which right, all of these events are constrained into the determinacy that makes them events and intelligible as events, right? But, yeah. but that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. That's this, we, 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 and that's why Porphyry is so cool because he's getting, like the Neoplatonists are getting, there's an alternative way of talking about no thingness that takes us towards what I would call real possibility as opposed to thinking of possibility as a deficiency of actuality, which is real. And it's interesting because the Neoplatonists have a practice where you prog you practice progressive no thingness. You first realize the no thing that where no, no thingness in the sense of not a particular object, then not a particular event, then not a particular space or time, and you right, and then that not a particular principle, and then that's how you move towards the one, right? You get you keep going to what's the real possibility that made the lower level possible, and you keep doing that talking talking about nothing it makes me really high <laughs> but 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 you can, it's got this quality of just it's really something i just notice in, in talking about lately as you're talking about that there's something really opening yeah sure come on in <laughs> i gotta hang on a sec yeah there you go Sorry, just had to uh, give somebody something. <laughs> that was so, funny. Oh, fun. So yeah, I mean, I, I think it is. Uh, it, it's. I mean, the. This is the part. This is the. This is the individual part of dialectic. Remember, guy, you and I were talking about how you know there is the group practice of dialectic, and then there's the individual practice, and the individual practice has to do with that ascent through real through through ascending, or for some reason in our metaphor we turn it the other way around. Right? but ascending orders of real possibility, real possibility, not just abstract nominal possibilities in thought, but the real possibilities. And, and what's interesting is as you are realizing them, you are in the sense of becoming aware of them, you realize that they are realizing you in the sense of making it possible for you to be there having that thought. Yeah. Like there's a realization of being realized, right? And, and, and that, that to me is a profound experience of meaning. That's a profound sense of being connected to the simultaneous fount of being and intelligibility. That's why I think you're getting high, guy. You're getting high because you're, you're taking the machinery of religio, of connectedness to that which matters beyond your egocentric concern, and you're running it like on max. Yeah. Of course, it's going to be, and it, and it, of course, it is and should be deeply meaningful to you. Yeah. But if you're locked into right a, a, a thinking that is bound to actuality and, and determinate, you know, spatial temporal objects as the defining touchstone of reality, then this kind of connectedness is impossible for you, and you won't have the reservoir of meaning in life in order to deal with the threat of despair. You won't have the home that Chris talks about. You have to deepen those connections so that you can face the no thingness. And if those connections are deep enough, it, you, you will see it as the fount of, the inexhaustible fount of being an intelligibility rather than the loss of yourself and your story. Hmm. Well put, John. Yes. Very well put. I think one of the ways in which dialogue structures precisely what you've just said, take everything you've just described. Yeah. One of the ways in which dialogue 
processually structures its phenomenology in order to well, afford well, that. Processually, what does that mean? Processually, like in, in as a matter of process. Okay, both. Okay, gotcha. um, the way it structures itself as to afford that anagogic, that, 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 um, that sort of anagogic opening that you've just described is, I think, it allows, it allows the individual to source his necessity, let's say, call it the necessity of his speech, from the possibility of, of silence. Oh, right. So this, this, I think, comes back to what you often talk about, Guy, mm -hmm. in the distinction between thinking and listening. One of the things that happens in dialogue and dialogos is that there is a dialectical opponent process between thinking and listening. Brilliant. Brilliant. And as it, as the process goes on mm -hmm. at the beginning, everyone struggles with, with the fact that we're constantly vacillating between one and the one and the other, because we can't do them simultaneously. But what begins to happen, what begins to happen. And we all know this because we've all experienced it together what begins to happen is that you begin to think with your speech mm. and speak with your silence. Mm. Mm. Oh, yes. They shift. Yes. They shift. Mm. Mm. And that becomes a way of reconfiguring the relationship between the possibility that sources the intelligibility that, fu that fundamentally shapes the dialogue and the necessity and actuality of actually having to pitch into it in any kind of concrete way. That's brilliant. That, that, ah, that interweaving of speech and listening that's inherent to the dialectic. That's, yes, that's brilliant, Chris. That is brilliant. That is analogous to the interweaving. Guy's insight. Yeah, the, the interweaving of the in and out in the meditative practice. That's what you're pointing to is the analogy, Guy. That's exactly where the analogous movement is happening. Yes, I totally agree with that, Chris. That was scintillatingly brilliant. <laughs> oh, thank you. And so, it, one that so it, it it now you can't we can't do that. Of course, we can't do that without the the apparatus yeah, of yeah. the fellowship. Right yes. within within dialogos, and so that's one of the reasons why I think that um, we have to social so we have to socialize. It's almost as though you know when when we speak, we subtract from the no thingness, and the subtraction from the no thingness has to become a, an act of communing with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has to become an act of confrontation rather than an act of avoidance, because typically when we speak, and especially when we speak in any kind of propositional manner, we speak in subtraction from the pure open possibility of no thingness, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, a, it's an avoidant mm -hmm. act in many cases. And I think that the, 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 the reorientation that happens in dialogos is that the act of gathering the collegenda, right? The, the act of gathering intelligibility in the form of speech becomes a confrontation with the nothingness rather than a subtraction from it. So, so Chris, do you think the otherness of the interlocutor is also contributory of us yes. being able to, right? Of us being able to confront the alterity of nothingness, especially if we're in a Western frame of mind in which, right, uh, the not the non being has this sort of pejorative otherness to it. Do you think that's yes? Yeah. I think that's exactly right, John. I think that's exactly right. And think of it this way. Think of it this way. When I speak, me. When I listen, not me. When I speak, me. When I listen, not me. Right. So that dialectic between those two states of speaking and listening also becomes a dialectic between my ego, as Christopher, and 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 being voiced with a perspective and now if i'm genuinely listening right yeah, 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 qualify yeah. that if i'm genuinely listening and not just sort of formulating as i'm you know if i'm genuinely listening there is a certain um that's it that's a that's a that the, the the i mean in the way that you described it guy having to listen um in the way you know i mean mm -hmm. necessitates yeah it necessitates a um 
it will it subordinates it subordinates your egocentrism it by necessity but, and so you, so there's a concept and and so between listening and thinking listening and thinking there is a dialectic between your fundamental egocentrism and its subtraction in the process and so you're you're so you're so again it's not it's not as though your 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 ego dissipates it's simply that your ego is constantly having to be qualified Yes. By the all that by by the other perspective that it has to then draw from to reconstitute itself. Yeah, that's where you start to overhear yourself in a different identity as you start yes. to hang yes. out with more people. Yeah, because because that's where there's where the stereoscopic fusion happens, right? Because I start to internalize the other, and I look when I self transcend, there has to be an other than my ego as it is now. That's what self-transcendence is. It's a self-othering. And when I internalize the other, I get a not, I like, there's a non-logical identity. Like, like Chris's perspective and my perspective have fused in an act of my own self-transcendence. I've othered to myself and transcended. My, it's a non-logical identity between as I am before and as I am after, because I've inter internalization is a stereoscopic fusion between my perspective and Chris's perspective, and that otherness is taken into, and it's an affordance of. Self-transcendence requires the space of otherness. It requires the non-being who you are. I, that's what Chris is exactly saying. And so when, you know how you talk about this guy, and you and I've noted this, when you're in the middle of like circling, you get this sense of the other person's perspective, not there looking at you, but suddenly it goes like this, and the two of you are looking out stereoscopically together. You and I have talked about that experience. That's the moment, right, when the non-logical identification occurs. Right, absolutely. And under those conditions, under those conditions, we become able, when, when that stereoscopic fusion happens of perspective, we become, we, we, we are suddenly born into the capacity to address ourselves as thou. That, that is what allows for the second person perspective. Yeah, 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 that's right. And so, that's why it's an ingress. That's why it's an ingress into the process of Socratic self-knowledge. Yeah. Because it actually manifests, it, it, it's, it's almost like a process of conjuration, a, a reconjuration of identity such that you, you suddenly, you suddenly are endowed with the capacity to witness yourself as thou mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. treat yourself in that commensurately. And, and then that means, of course, that deepens the real possibility of addressing others, including the world, as thou. Yeah. Yes, yeah. that's right. Your because thou then you, ability. you address yourself as yeah. thou. Your thou also, ability of address. Yeah, the thou the ability. Thing. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Right. <laughs> I'm saying it's like <laughs> I'm hearing um, I'm hearing Hermes in here somewhere. I, and specifically, just thinking about like the specifics of that we're using language and speech, mm -hmm. right? And Hermes being the god, the messenger god, and particularly that Hermes is a strange one, right? Because he's neither he's not he's he has a not there's a not there's a there's a not a lot of not in Hermes right there's like he's not quite god he's not quite human he's this world of in between mm -hmm. there's something about the her, the hermeneutic everything hermeneutic has this quality of of negation but presencing through negation right especially with you know just like when you when you read, right, you, you don't read by measuring the shapes of the letters, right? You read by actually, in some sense, not seeing the shape of the letters, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, you the... but you end up experiencing the word, right? Mm -hmm. Yet it's the negation of the shapes of the letters that allow for, you know, so I'm also feeling just this, this sense of, you know, because I was thinking about this, because like what, one of the things I think that I think to get at to get at this sense of emptiness, right? I think it'd be very difficult to un. It, I often just automatically go to space, right? I think emptiness. I think space. But what does it mean for to say that like that 
time is ultimately empty all the way down, right? What does it mean for a word to be empty? What does it mean for a self to be empty? Absolute emptiness all the way down. This is the thing I'm getting about, like reading the Shatani. He's, 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 yeah, I'll just, I'll just like leave it at that. So like, just, I just noticed I'm hearing Hermes. Well, Hermes is the psychopomp that guides the souls into the underworld. And that's what you just wanted to do there. You wanted to take, take emptiness all the way down, right? The deepest death all the way down. So I, 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 I think that, that, that rather than the messenger of the God, I think Hermes as the psychopomp is uh, uh, what's going on here. Well, but, but that's what I was trying to do when I was invoking real possibility especially because it, it, it's almost a contradiction for the Western mind, because possibility is neither temporal nor spatial, right? right. Possibility, possibility is, a, is, is ontologically more primitive, more primordial. That's right. um, that's uh, right. Like that's what I said, there's no time, there's no, there's like, there isn't an event equals MC squared, just like there isn't a spatial location for it too, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and, and it's no coincidence that it's the mathematical aspects of science, especially the relational mathematics, the part, the parts of modern science directly and explicitly influenced by Neoplatonism, that that example comes so readily to mind. Um, so um, I think that to say that time is empty is to, is to say that the attempt to locate it, and this is Bergson's great critique, the attempt to, I mean, this is, it's paradoxical, but the attempt to locate it in space is, of course, a big mistake. This is Bergson's great critique of what he called the spatialization of time, right? And then, but I used to, I, I went, when I was living with my stepson, I would go into his room sometimes and write weird things on his white whiteboard. And so, um, and one time I went in um, at, just to try to provoke him into thinking, um, and I, I wrote, does time take time to happen? <laughs> time, time can't be inside of time, but everything that we think of is inside of time. Can't, time can't take time to happen because then the bottom of time drops out. You can't think of time that way. Is that, okay, so that's, okay. So here's this other thing that Nish Nishida talks about a lot, right? Which yep. is, okay, consider that, that so the West gets into this thing where it says the ground of everything is rationality and therefore it, 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 um, all this gravity is for the subject, right? So everything's in terms of the subject. So then you end up in all these paradoxes where you're like, well, then how do they connect if there's subject object and, yeah, and, yeah. and that, and he says that in the, in Japan, right? In, in, in Sunyata, the home ground of everything, right, is is on is is on is on nothing, right, and that it's that it's uh, this notion. It's I love this notion, like seeing something from its home ground of in mm. in from emptiness, is 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 in some sense it's 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 dethroning the self and its subjectivity, right. Yeah. It, it's to it's to realize. Well, this is what I've been trying. I'm, I want to return back to that point in a sec because I have a counter criticism. This is one of my criticisms of the Kyoto School. But anyways, um, uh, that's what I've been trying to get at with the non-temporal spatial sense of the moreness of the thing. And that's the, the way, that's the, the, the interpenetrability, the interbeing that Nishitani talks about. But it's also, the, right, it's things are perpetually withdrawing into the mysterious moreness and they're perpetually shining forth into the non-categorizable suchness. These are the two mysteries that thought can't grasp. We can't grasp the combinatorial explosive nature of, of things, and we can't ultimately grasp the specific unique suchness of this because it's precisely non-categorical. And those two are non-logically identical for us because they are both ways in which we are put into touch with the field from which intelligibility springs. That's what I take to be the home ground. My critique of the Kyoto School is the one area, the one, and I think I mentioned this to you, I think I, I've said this before, Religion and Nothingness is one of the top five books 
I think, written. I, I, I put it in my top five books. Yeah. I read it a couple of times. I want to read it again. Uh, the Kyoto School is deeply important. But the one area that I think N uh, Nishitani, now this is where he's different from D.T. Suzuki, by the way. Nishitani doesn't get, he doesn't really get Neoplatonism. The, the, way, he, the way he understands, for example, Platonic rationality is not subjectively oriented. Yeah. It is definitely, definitively yeah. not subjectively oriented. Yeah. And Neoplatonism, I just read it to you, is not oriented that way at yeah. all. That's a mistake. Now, D.T. Suzuki gets Neoplatonism in his book on Buddhist and Christian mysticism, where he compares Prajna to Eckhart, who's a Christian yeah. Neoplatonist. And he says, yeah. they're, they're basically saying the same thing. He gets it. But this is my, this is my one sort of like, ah, the right. mission he doesn't get. He, I think he's too influenced by the later Heidegger reading of Plato, like yeah. that Rakowski talks about, rather than the earlier reading of Plato, right. or the way Heidegger sort of right. castigates Plato as, you know, basically a proto Descartes, which I think is a fundamental misreading. Mm -hmm. But I think Rakowski and other people are right that the earlier Heidegger gets, yeah. gets Plato better. And I think oh, yeah. is getting the late Heidegger's misframing of Plato. And yeah. that's, making him misread, misread the Neoplatonic tradition, I think, in a fundamental way. Yeah, totally. Totally. This has been quite ecstatic. <laughs> well, it, it has to be. Anything less, anything less. I love that have to. <laughs> <laughs> Anything less would be just to speak about it. And we're not trying to speak about it. We are trying to yeah. use speech as the ritual of invocation. We are trying to invoke it, mm -hmm. not just speak about it. Mm -hmm. What is the use of just speaking yeah. about it? Yeah. What is the use of speaking about anything that really matters if you're not invoking it? Yeah. So you know something about, so, so there's also another, there's another like I think a, a more kind of the machinery of, di of, of dialectic and especially being in speech and conversation, right? And I've been noted, been experimenting with this and when I've been meditating, right? Where I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, there's the meditation where I'm, you know, I, I'm focusing on my breath or I'm focusing on nothing, you know, that kind of the more the Eastern stuff. And then I'll see like, okay, then I'll, I'll listen to a book, right? And and see if I can do, if I can meditate while reading the book, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, can, I re can I meditate while I'm actually engaged in listening to conceptual things? And it is, first of all, I, I haven't been able to get to the point where it seems like I'm either in one or the other. I lose one or the other, one or the other, one or the other. But one of the things I find is somehow doing that, right, is I notice that there's a different quality of there's when I listen to it, right? When I, I get caught up, if you will, in the book, it seems to it seems to evoke its own kind of presence, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that I'm not present. It's like I'm present in a different way, and it seems yeah. to evoke a different quality of presence, right? And so I've been thinking about like, you know, just so, some of these things because you know it. Uh, Japanese philosophy is, is relatively new to me. I'm a little bit, I'm a lot more familiar with Tibetan, Tibetan stuff, mm -hmm. but I think they're, they're, they're Tibetans are, they're great. But like <laughs> this, this, um, this kind of sense of, of, of the way that, the way that Zen and, and Japan really, really do have this sense of nothingness. You can, it's just so much more yeah. a part of, of, of the fabric of it. So this, it's, it's pretty new to me to, to, to explore this. So I've just been thinking a lot about this. And so the other part I started to think about, well, what, what is a way that, you, that they, they, they actually practice this in some kind of social interaction? And it's tea ceremonies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's, there's something about, um, as I've been reading tea ceremonies, it's very similar to that, that, that sense in which on some level they're engaged in the, on one level they're drinking tea. Yeah. On another level, they're not drinking tea, right? Mm -hmm. They're, they're not drinking tea and they're drinking tea absolutely at the same time, right? And I, there's a way that they're, what they're actually doing is they're dwelling in emptiness, right? The whole thing is about emptiness, but yet it's all about being precisely in the engagement of what they're inside of. 
so there's there's another there's another quality of that I've been I've been thinking about as we as we've been gearing up for these conversations with it is like okay, well what in what way, right? The actual speaking and listening as a as a way of dwelling and being present with thinking and listening in itself a, a part of this, right? So I just wanted to bring. Well, well, well the tea ceremony is exactly what I was, what I said we were doing. It's a ritual invocation, right? It's a ritual invocation, and the precision is to point you towards the it, the non-categorizable suchness of what's happening, yeah. right? But the openness is to always get that reverberating with the mysterious moreness into which everything withdraws. That's yeah. that, that's the whole point. At least that's my reading of D.T. Suzuki's reading of the tea ceremony. Right. And I wanted to go back to, and I want to link that to the thing you just said if, right before that. When I'm reading Plotinus, the genius of Plotinus is that I'm simultaneously meditating and doing this deep conceptual work at the same time. Yeah. That is what struck me in the face when I was reading Plotinus. It was like, oh my gosh, I am simultaneously doing this tremendous conceptual work and at the same time i am going through a meditative movement at the same time and i have tried very very hard to emulate that and i, I found that also in spinoza spinoza is even more like you're doing this but then you get the scantia intuitiva that that has changed my life that kind of the way you just taught like that I don't think I'd be the same person if I didn't have those experiences with authors like that in those experiences, like those, th that, that's, that's, that's the Holy grail for me. Yeah. That, you know, that, one, of the, one of the other things too, is that good, it's not just works. It's not just straightforward works of philosophy that do that too. I also find that really good fiction does oh, yeah. that as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it just uses a different apparatus. It uses, it uses a different edifice a different yeah. kind of edifice to scaffold the structure. But fundamentally, the process is the same, which is to say that you, be, you, you're, you're, you move in train with a particular sequence, particular narrative sequence, right? Just as the tea ceremony marks yeah. itself with particular movements in a particular order. It's the same for narrative, but you know, really, really good novelists, what we might call philosophical novelists, what they do quite deliberately is they constrain, they constrain, they constrain with narrative, and then suddenly they open. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then, of course, they recourse, they, they return at some point to the narrative, right? So the dissolution and the resolution, that contraction, that, um, that, um, that expansion and contraction um, is, is simply part of the geometry of the entire experience that is laid out in the form, in the artistic form. So, so I just read The Plague with Dan Chappie, and so that is amazing. And, and that's where I got my, my sort of slogan from, from Tar the character Taru. Uh, you know, I want to know how to be a saint without God. That's the whole problem I'm up against these days. But I was thinking about that and something came to mind and then it clicked with what Guy was saying a few minutes ago, right? Because I think there's a way in which non-being and vulnerability come together because like when when i when i look through my glasses they're no longer my they're no longer there as my glasses but they're actually the real possibility of me seeing they it's the vulnerability in them such that i can see through them that actually affords me seeing by means of them and beyond them and it's, so it's it's their non-being as glasses that actually, because I stopped seeing them as, uh, like they disappear from view, they right? And it's because they, bec in, because they, in the way in which they become completely transparent, right? They're, there's a kind of, there's, there's a vulnerability to transparency that affords them being real possibilities of me seeing other than them by seeing through and beyond them. And, uh, what I'm what I'm getting is like we the works of literature. I mean, because that's what happens in a great work of literature, right? You, you you're not you you, st you you do that. There's that moment, right? Like an analogous, as you're saying, Chris. Like when you're reading Platon, there's that moment, as you said, when it explodes, and you're outside of the narrative, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking through the narrative to what is trans narrative, and the narrative exactly. has a vulnerability to it, it right? Exactly. And it's, it it allows itself to be. 
a, a, a no thing to us so that we can see beyond it. It's vulnerable to us. It right? becomes a question, it becomes a yes. question of its being. Yes, exactly. Its form becomes a question. That's essentially yeah. what happens. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's yeah. This, there's great this connection. Way which, there's this way that there's almost a, uh, like it, it for me, the affective state that's now coming up when I when I'm talking about this is I, like a tenderness uh, towards the, the 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 because everything is now striking me as having this capacity for this 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 vulnerability that transports me through that thing to everything else. Yeah, mm. that's beautifully put, John. Your ecstasis. Well, even ecstasis, this sense of yeah dwelling in by standing over and out of my dwelling in being the dwelling in right yes that is that is pri primordial ecstasis right i think so I'm feeling that a lot i've noticed so in one of the things i've noticed and i don't know quite what to make of it in this conversation i, I just i could feel it when we're talking about like the back and forth, right? So I see through the glasses and the glasses withdrawal, right? Yeah. And they afford everything that I see. And then like, and then in a moment I, I pop back and I realize, oh my God, there was the glasses that afforded that. And now I'm present <laughs> to the glasses, right? And then I look back out and they withdraw again. There's, and I, there's something in me and I was thinking about, there's something about this is agonist, right? Getting this stuff, there's like, it's ecstasy, but there's also this like, oh. <laughs> quality to it right and i think what what it is is there's some part of me that wants it i, I don't know if this is my implicit uh, uh attachment to actuality but I, I think i feel a little bit like kant or something like i want to i want the presuppositions i want to hold the presuppositions while having them act as presuppositions i don't want them i want ev i want to see everything and be aware of everything at the same time i just <laughs> I noticed that tension in me. I think that's a tension. You want to dwell in both worlds simultaneously. And but, isn't that that isn't that the Kantian sense, right? How he kind of ended up with well, you, the thing in itself is because I think Johannes was talking about this, where he wanted to he he didn't want the presuppositions to go in the background that afforded the foreground yeah. so he just ended up having to split everything logically right and so there's that there is that sense of and this is okay and then when you said tenderness right um and vulnerability i think that's the that's where that's where i feel it like in a certain sense there is a sense of letting something go to the background right and you're surrendering to something here. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, I, I guess for me, I mean Kant is the opposite, right? For so for Kant, intelligibility is that which walls us off. Yeah. In reality, but for the Neoplatonists, well, intelligibility, intelligibility are the glass or is the glasses of the world. <laughs> intelligibility is that is that which is the most vulnerable through which we see beyond all possible intelligibility. That's the one, right? Uh, yeah. Why do I want to see it as I'm seeing with it? What is that in me? I just noticed it's in me. <laughs> is, that, is that in you too? Like I want to see the glasses as I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know if your motivation is the same as Kant's. I, mean, I doubt it. I don't really, I haven't really read Kant. I've read about Kant. Oh, Kant, Kant is, you know, Hume woke me from my do dogmatic slumber. Kant is really worried about skepticism. Yeah. But, right, and so he can't, skepticism, if you, if you just decide, and I think you ultimately have to make a choice, I don't, there is no way within, right, within the, the framework of skepticism to argue somebody out of skepticism. Yeah, boy, yeah. boy, an undergraduate education in philosophy, if that's the one thing you learn from it, it that's what you learn from it, right? Mm. And so what you have to come to, and I think this is the, again, the, uh, the Neoplatonic insight, is mm -hmm. if, if there isn't an aspect of knowing that isn't also being, if, it, if there isn't participatory knowing, 
then that's what you have. You have absolute skepticism. If, if the mind and reality don't share, right? But the, but the opposite is true. And this is my counter move to Kant. Insofar as I reject skepticism as ultimately self-defeating and non-viable, and, yeah. and therefore absolutely no guide to rationality yeah. and to life, I am committed to there being some ultimate relationship of participation between yeah. intelligibility and that which transcends and will always transcend intelligibility. Right. And there's that kind of that what that that yes. disclosure and discernment. Exactly. Exactly. Like, exactly. Like disclosure and discernment. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And those two together. And the whole point of the project of gnosis feeling, is to realize in sense, right yeah. it's just interesting feeling that just a, a scent like a stretch of that of like i just want but it is cool it's, it feels a little bit more religious <laughs> it feels a little bit more well argues that it is yeah right in, in thinking being he you know the, uh, which is a beautiful explication of you know the whole tradition from parmenides to aquinas Right? He says the proper attitude is religious. But it's tragic too, so in some level. But but yeah. Like, but imagine imagine if the beauty of this, this goes back to Chris. Imagine if the beauty of, of this communitas became strong enough that the sense of exposure to skepticism that has been ingrained in us by our culture and is pervasive as an undercurrent in our culture, what if it became a strong enough countercurrent? That, that concern for exposure to skepticism drops away. Yeah, right, right. It becomes a way of making play. Yes. Rather than something dogmatic. So, so yeah. as, we're, as we're talking, I'm noticing, right, that kind of almost what felt like a mental desire has like sunk down into this kind of place where I was like, it's actually just in my heart. And then I was feeling this quality of tragedy, <laughs> right? This sense of tragedy, but in this, in this ecstatic sense of like the two fingers, right? Yeah. Like if those touched that, I mean, no one would even pay attention to that. It's like, it's that they don't touch, right? And that there is um, that space is- Yeah, because if they touched, then Adam would not have a space in which he could self-transcend towards God. Yeah. Yeah. There would be no despair and no recovery therefrom. This felt like 3,000 miles away. Gents, I'm sorry to say it, but I'm going to have to duck out. Well, it feels I like we just got started. I but, think, but no, I think this is a good place to go, and I need to go really too. Really place. I need to go too. Did you guys just drop me into infinity? I'll, um... <laughs> you are always there. We're all there together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love being with you guys. This was tremendously helpful. Yeah, yeah. I think this has already opened up a lot for so encouraging. What Chris and I are going to start doing. So thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Guy. John, this was great. It always is. Yeah. It always is. I'll, I'll put out the email for for the four of us to meet. Right. Uh, and it'd be great if uh, if you had a chance you can share this file with me, Guy. I'll, I'll put it up on my channel. Oh, and the other, I forgot to present you the other one, too. Yep, please do. All right. Bye. Take care. Hey, gents. Have a good evening, Chris.